and my it drives my wife crazy because you know we'll be laying in bed for a half an hour 45 minutes sometimes and i'll be like hey iris are you awake i just thought of something i gotta talk to you about this she'll be like are you freaking kidding me go to sleep dude talk to me in the morning and i'm like no wait a minute i gotta get up and write this down because i don't want to lose it you know and so i've got like 15 of these little right in the rain notebooks strapped together with a rubber band at my desk and all of them have different subject matter and if i think of something i go yank it out and i write it down so i can refer back to it the next day or the next week or when i get a chance to develop that idea or that product or that class or that new project and, and so i guess that's really that that's the it's a long answer but it's really just kind of it, it's just inbred in me and i can't get rid of it all right, guys, welcome back to Campfire Chats with Honorable Outfitters. Today, we have a very special guest. We have Dave Canterbury. Now, most of you, if not all of you, already know this gentleman from his longstanding history in the, the campcraft and bushcraft community. He was on some television series. He's now been on uh, lots of different uh, newscasting sources for missing people. That The guy is just a, a superstar in the outdoor world. He travels all over the world. Uh, and as a guest at various different wilderness survival schools. Uh, Dave, I really appreciate you coming on and uh, taking your time out of your day for this. Oh, it's not a problem at all, buddy. All right, so we're going to start off with a couple warm-up questions. Could you share some insights into your personal background and how your love for history and the outdoors developed? Um, you know, I've always been a history fan, even in school. That was kind of my favorite subject was history. And I grew up kind of going camping and things like that with my father. I kind of had a unique situation because my parents were divorced when I was about two years old. And so my stepfather was kind of the woodsman, the hunter. You know, he would go, you know, he'd take me fishing and squirrel hunting, deer hunting, mushroom hunting, all that kind of stuff. Taught me how to trap. And then my real father, he was a dive instructor, but he was also kind of an adrenaline junkie. So he used to fly hang gliders and that kind of stuff. And so we spent a lot of time around the water and things like that when I was a kid with him. So I spent about half of my childhood down Dow Hall Reservoir down Tennessee doing various things like that. And then the other half up in, up in Indiana in the woods running the White River area and banks doing stuff with my stepdad. So I kind of got that eclectic childhood of the outdoors from kind of both sides of the coin. And so I kind of grew up loving the outdoors. And I spent some time, you know, down with one of my grandfathers in Shoals, Indiana, which is way deep south Indiana in the woods in the middle of nowhere. He had built his own cabin, dug his own well. Um, he was kind of a self-sufficient living guy back in the, you know, late 60s, early 70s before it was cool, like it is now, to be, you know, off the grid. He lived off the grid. And I kind of spent a lot of time with him down there as well. And so I had... A childhood growing up around that stuff and it just gave me a great love for the outdoors and nature you know i was kind of a science geek when i was a kid too you know i collected reptiles and fossils and all kinds of rocks and all that kind of stuff and so i just kind of grew up around this stuff and always loved it and then after i got out of the military i just decided that i wanted to spend a lot more time outdoors so i did a lot of things including reenacting i did 18th century reenacting for many years spent quite a bit of time down in Dana Boone National Forest and I ran with a lot of the guys that are really famous without dropping any names in that genre for a while learning things as well and so that kind of took me into the traditional archery side of things and I started heavy into traditional archery and I actually won the Cloverdale Traditional Nationals in 2006 I believe it was 2007 somewhere in that neighborhood and so my love for traditional archery continued and I started an outfitters business which kind of led to the business that I'm in now because people were like, where can I buy this gear? Where can I get that? How can I do that? Can you make videos on doing this, that, and the other thing? And it kind of led to where I'm at today. Oh, daggone. So you've always had an adventurous personality. Were you, were yeah. you scared growing up as a kid at these things? You just kind of worked those those fears? Or you no, just I mean, I kind of got used to sleeping, you know, in the woods with my parents and stuff. My, my, real father we slept in tents all the time you know i slept in tents with my cousins and things like that cowboy camped in front of the campfire down at the lake a lot of times and then obviously out in the woods hunting and trapping with my stepfather we spent a lot of nights out in the woods and he was big on that you know just throw a sleep bag on the ground beside the fire and go to sleep and don't worry about it and so i kind of grew up with all those noises of animals and things that would bother people in the woods and it just never really bothered me oh nice that's cool were there any specific historic events or outdoor experiences that had a, a profound or serious impact on you? No, I don't, I'd be searching 
to say that there was because I don't I think it's just a, a matter of kind of everything. I mean, I, I think my first taste of my first taste of a survival type scenario happened down in Florida where I actually could say, you know, I was a little bit worried about what the outcome was going to be. And I was a commercial fisherman down in Florida and I was working with a guy on a boat and we were doing inland mullet fishing. And we had taken a skiff and pushed it deep into a slough during the mullet row season, <clears throat> pretty far away from the boat. Actually, you couldn't see the boat from where we were at for sure. And when we got done, the the tide was going out, and so the boat was in pretty shallow water. But we got back in the boat, and the boat wouldn't start. We had a whole whole skiff full of mullet. We had a whole cooler full of mullet that we'd shucked. And we didn't have a whole lot of water because we were only, you know, maybe an hour and a half from the boat dock or the fish house and the boat would start. So we were kind of stranded out there in an area where not too many people other than another commercial fisherman would go. And that was kind of his private spot. And the commercial fisherman kind of respected that. So the chance of somebody coming by was maybe they will, maybe they won't. And we ended up getting stuck out there for about two and a half days with very little water. We were actually drinking the cooler water. Uh, I won't even. Ugh, I don't even think about this, but we ended up drinking the fish water out of the cooler to get fresh water because we ran out of fresh water. And some weather came in; it was pretty nasty. We were kind of hunkered down in the boat under tarps. And finally, you know, about two and a half days in, somebody came looking for him because he didn't come into the fish house that night or the next morning. So somebody actually came looking for us and found us. But that was probably the closest I've been to a really crappy scenario, and it kind of woke me up to the fact that, you know, you should be more prepared. When you go do things, even if you assume everything's going to be all right. Dang, oh, man, that's harrowing. That's like that's absolutely <laughs> terrifying, <laughs> especially in it, deep water. It, well, it wasn't deep water. That was, I mean, it wasn't deep water. It was in a, it was in a shallow area, but it was in an area where off the coast where lots of weather comes in. You get lots of lightning storms and things like that, and if you're surrounded by salt water. It doesn't matter how deep or shallow it is if you can't get out of the boat and walk. Right. You're still stuck. You know what I mean? Man, it's, that's an interest. I, I've never heard you talk about that experience on any of your other interviews or anything I, I've seen of yours. Uh, so you, you were in the military. You worked as a commercial fisherman for a period of time. What other things have you done? Well, I worked as a commercial fisherman because I was running a reptile farm for a guy. I was kind of like the manager of the farm. And this commercial fisherman used to come out there a lot and bring turtles that he had caught in his net, not sea turtles, uh, a brackish water turtle, terrapin. And he would bring them out there and he would sell them to the reptile farm. And he was out one day and we're in the venomous room. And that's where I stored all my dive gear because I was a certified diver because my father was a dive instructor. So I got certified when I was 13. And so I had a bunch of dive gear in this venomous room, just a storage in the corner. And he walked into that venomous room with me one day and he's like, hey, man, are you a diver? And I'm like, yeah. And we had gotten to be pretty good friends just from him coming back and forth to the farm and things like that. And he said, you know what? He said, how'd you like to make some real money? And I said, well, what's that going to take? What's that look like? You know? And he said, well, he said, I'll tell you what, I got this boat and I'm a commercial fisherman. I do a lot of shallow water fishing around shallow water wrecks where people have like sunk in a houseboat or sunk in a speedboat or something like that in, you know, 15, 20 feet of water. And he would go out and he would drop a net around that wreck because a lot of the fish would congregate around that wreck. A lot of the, you know, the snappers and the groupers and things like that would congregate around those wrecks. And he said, but when I drop my nets around those wrecks, a lot of times the fish won't all just jump in the net because they'll hang on the wreck. He said, if I had a diver that was willing to jump in the water in that net and use a powerhead to shoot the hull of the vessel with like a powerhead, like a 357 powerhead out of a spear gun, then it scares all the fish and they blow right into the net. And he said, and while you're down there, if there's any like big groupers or something hanging a hole in the wreck or a piece of pipe or something, you could just spear gun those and bring them up and shoot them in the head. That pays $5 a pound at the fish house and you can have all that money. And I'll give you 50% of everything else we catch just for helping me out and getting the nets off the wrecks and scaring the fish out of the wrecks into my nets and help me shuck fish out of the nets. And so we built a relationship based around that for a long period of time. And then what changed all of that was when commercial fishing got outlawed in Florida within three miles of shore. And when that happened, it kind of, it kind of sunk my career, I guess, if you want to call it that in that realm of things. And so I just kind of, at that point, you know, it's kind of personal, but my mother, my real mother was dying of cancer. She had had cancer for several years at that point. And so I decided to kind of pick up stakes in Florida and move back to Indiana to spend time with my mom 
until she passed away. Oh, and you just kind of stayed in the area after that? Yep, yep. I was born there in Indiana anyway, so I just kind of, once I came back home, I just kind of stayed home. Gotcha. What sparked your interest in living history, and how did it shape your perspective? Um, you know, it shaped my, uh, we'll get to that in a minute, I guess. The, the sparking of it, I think, came from the first time I went to Friendship, Indiana. Mm -hmm. uh, big you know, the, 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 oh yeah. Well, I lived in Indiana, so I was familiar with the event and I went to the event a couple times when I was younger and I liked it a lot. And then when I got back to Indiana, I was like, you know what, I'm going to go check this out again. And I went a couple more times before I actually got into the reenacting end of it. And then I found out after I had gone there that I really, I started reading up on it and, and doing some research and of course found people like Mark Baker. Um, and so that kind of sparked my interest in the 18th century end of it. And when I started doing that 18th century reenacting and started really doing the living history portion of it, it kind of got me to that discovery of all the things that they could do with very little accoutrements on their, on their person. You know, they didn't carry very much stuff. And that kind of really was what started that research road to the 10 C's of survivability, because that research from the 18th century back to like Utsi of the Iceman, that whole time period there, if you look at the evidence of the archaeological evidence, they really carried the five C's 99.99999% of the time. And other than that, it was just something to secure food or something for personal security or protection. Everything else kind of fell into those categories of the five C's. And so that's really what kind of developed that mentality. Now, for those uh, listeners and viewers, can you uh, just quickly recap what the five C's are? Of your sure, system? I'm sorry. I apologize. Yeah. So, you know, tools that have been proven throughout time to be carried by people that are critical to survival, but also difficult to recreate from the landscape without a specialized skill level or specialized material are cutting tools, combustion devices to make fire, cover elements to protect your body and protect you from exterior elements. Uh, containers to be able to cook food, boil water, things like that, and then cordages to be able to tie, lash, and bind. And those are really kind of the five C's I developed in that system. And it's not really one of each of these items. It's multiples of these items in the category. They're categories of items of things you're going to carry to base your kit on. And then you add and subtract things as you go to find out what works for you. Nice. Have you ever had a conversation out there in Indiana with uh, James Townsend or his father back in the day when you were doing your living I history? Have, I have not had a con direct conversation with James Townsend. He's one of the only people probably big in that industry that I haven't spoken to personally. Oh, man. We got to make that happen someday, man. That would be good, man. That would be good. <laughs> be a good conversation. How did your gradual interest in wilderness survival lead you to start your own wilderness survival school? Okay. So that kind of came about. Again, during that period of time when I was doing some reenacting and doing some outfitting at the same time, um, and I started, I actually was, <laughs> it's a funny story, I was actually napping arrowheads from glass and obsidian in my kitchen on a tarp, and my brother-in-law came over to the house and he was watching what I was doing, and he was like, you know, you should really put some of that stuff on YouTube, and this is back in 2007 when YouTube was brand new, right? And I was like, what the hell is YouTube? I never even heard of that. And he's like, oh, you got to check it out. There's people making videos of how to do stuff. And you can put your videos on there and people watch it and they learn from you. And I'm like, really? Okay, well, let me let me check that out. So when I first started making videos of that type on, on YouTube, there was probably less than 10 guys in the bushcraft and survival industry that were even making videos. And you think about that, that's 2007, 8 time frame. And this is 2023, and there's 500,000 people making those kind of videos now. So that's how much has exponentially grown over a fairly short time with social media. But that's kind of what got me started because as I started making these videos, people would ask me questions like, hey, can you do a video on this? Can you do a video on that? Hey, can I come and learn from you personally how to do that? Because I'm not as good at watching somebody do something as I would be if I could see it personally firsthand and you kind of show me and talk me through it and give me answers to direct questions instead of trying to answer on YouTube after the fact. And so that led me to start putting groups of people together at state parks and things like that up in up above Columbus, 
Ohio at uh, Camp Lazarus at one of the Boy Scout camps and doing things with people and charging them a little bit of money for materials and lessons and things like that. And that led to me starting the school. That's cool, man. So you and I have that tie with Camp Lazarus. I was a scout, though, not an adult. I, I've been up there with my scouts since, but Camp Lazarus okay. is a pretty nice camp. That is a nice place, for sure. What was the vision behind establishing the school, and how has it evolved over time as you've gone through things? Well, I think the reason for establishing the school was I kind of learned early on in my in the reenacting, in the, in the archery, and that kind of stuff that I loved to teach people. You know, I... I, I'm an engineer by trade, an automotive engineer, quality engineer, and process engineer. Okay. And I did that for a lot of years. I'm actually a Six Sigma black belt, I'm certified through Motorola and quality control and process. And so I did that for a lot of years. That's actually what I was doing when I quit my job to start doing this full time. I was actually driving two hours every day, one way to work in a Jeep with no top, 365 days a year, pretty much, um, in Ohio. So you know what that's like, yeah. bundled up snow mask on with no top on a jeep but anyway um and so i kind of found that love of teaching to be something that i really enjoyed doing and the more i started doing it with groups of people the more i enjoyed it and i thought you know this is a great thing to be able to pass on knowledge that other people may not have and teach them something that they can teach to someone else it's kind of like that you know teach one to teach another mentality and so that really grew inside me and i just decided, you know, this is what I want to do. I want to be a teacher. The business end of this, the whole self-reliance outfitters and the whole big corporate business, all of that to me is just a bonus because I really created the school and the, just a small part of that business before anything else. And the school has always been what really mattered to me is the teaching. And if I can provide myself with a living from that, and a peripheral living from writing books and selling gear and things like that, that feeds that ability to be able to teach full time, mm -hmm. then that's what I'm going to do. And that's what I've decided to do, you know, for my whole life now. Man, you are a passionate teacher and it comes through on all the videos and all your interactions that I see on the, the Facebook group that you guys have. Like you walk the walk and talk the talk when it comes to teaching. And, you know, as a professional teacher, there's lots of others who I've seen out in the wild, so to speak, who right. are just natural teachers. And it all comes from that passion that you have. If you have no passion, you're going to be a horrible teacher. I agree. I agree. Yeah. If you look at, if you look at teaching people as babysitting for money, and I know guys that look at it like that, you're not a teacher and you're never going to be good at it. Yeah. I, I spend, I mean, I wake up in the morning at seven o'clock and I'm out of my house and down at the bottom of my camp and my classroom, probably by eight o'clock and I'm fiddling with something almost every single day, all day long. If I'm not physically teaching or I'm out in the woods, hunting, fishing, trapping, tweaking something, doing something, testing something new, developing a new piece of a gear. And I live that life because I love it so much. And if you don't love it, you can't live it. It's just like every day's a vacation. If you love what you're doing, that's the old saying, right? And Amen. there's no question about that in my mind. That, there's uh, pictures that you constantly post on your Facebook page, too, of your, you and your instructor staying up to like 2 a.m., 3 a.m., or whatever it takes, oh, yeah. helping your people get through whatever the challenge is. If they're willing to do it, you're willing to stay up with them. Yeah, that's absolutely know? a fact. I mean, especially we I mean, we do quit early in some of the some of the lower, lower, lower end classes. I say lower end by like less skill level required or less of a testing required like the basic level classes some of the bushcrafting classes those classes we usually quit around i'm a big daylight to dark guy i like starting at daylight stopping at dark unfortunately in the summertime that becomes 14 hours instead of 12 but that's just life i love that so it didn't matter to me but when it comes to your more advanced level classes you know intermediate advanced um, advanced bushcraft things like that yes we're going to stay up all night long to make sure that you get done what you got to get done that you, if you need any help, we're there for you. And we'll take shifts just sleeping in the dirt. You know, the class before this last one, a guy just made, a guy made a comment. He was like, you reminded me of the Wicked Witch of the West on Wizard of Oz because you were like, your head was underneath your four-wheeler and your feet were sticking out and you had a tarp over your legs and you were asleep on the dirt. And I'm like, well, I was just catching a couple hours in between while somebody else was teaching someone else, you know? And it's like, but that passion is what I have. I don't... I don't need a fancy 
you know, shelter that takes 40 hours to build, I can pull up somewhere in the dirt and just throw my blanket on the ground, and I'm good with that. It doesn't bother me. You think uh, some of your military background has something to do with I hear military guys say that all the time, the Army and yeah. Marines, man. <laughs> I don't, you know, I really don't know about that. I mean, we did spend a lot of time in the field on and off when I was in the military, and I just spent some time in Central America. But I don't think, I think that ability to be comfortable outdoors and be comfortable with minimal stuff really just came from actually being a kid and doing this stuff all the time with my, my cousins and my parents and things like that. It just became, you know, like, hey, if we're just going to sleep out here by the fire tonight, throw a sleep bag on the ground, and it, that's good. That's not a problem. And so it grew up not being an issue, so I don't look at it as an issue now. I think people that have never camped before or just started camping recently in their life or just started doing this whole bushcraft and survival thing late in life don't have that advantage, and so they're not comfortable with it. It takes a while to get to that point. They think they have to have a tent or they have to have a hammock or they have to have an elaborate shelter with a fire and all of those things when if in reality, you know, 90% of the time, if I go out by myself and probably 75% of the time, even in classes with my instructors, we don't even build a fire unless we're going to cook food. We just flop on the ground and go to sleep. And that's what I'm used to. And it doesn't bother me. You, you mentioned in your, uh, your previous statements that, you know, you're constantly outdoors. You're constantly experimenting. You're constantly trying new things. When it comes into the products that you sell, what, what inspired you to venture into that aspect of the outdoor industry okay so a lot of it stemmed in the beginning from people asking me like they would see me use something in a video on youtube and they would say where can i get that where can i get that where can i get that and some of the things that we're using at that point in time just like our forefathers just like you know miller and verrill and gibson and nesmuk and kepar i used a lot of surplus stuff mm -hmm. because it was readily available and it was cheap so when people were asking where to get it, sometimes it was hard to tell them where to go buy it because not everybody has a surplus store within 40 or 50 miles of their house, right? So uh, I started looking for this stuff and seeking this stuff and going to gun shows and places I could buy surplus stuff and I would buy it and I would resell it to people who were looking for it. And that led to working with some other companies that were developing kit and things that I liked really well. And then that kind of led into... You know, my big, I guess my claim to fame, if you want to call it that, in the outdoor gear world is stainless steel cookware. That's really our mainstay, right? And all of that, almost every bit of that has developed from two things. A, a water bottle, a canteen, which obviously the military uses canteen, so I was used to the canteen concept. And then those nesting cook sets, you know, right. that you from the 40s and the 50s and you know the forest service cook sets the palco cook sets where everything nested inside each other and you had pots pans cups bowls spoons in one container that you could carry off and that inspired almost everything i've done since then and everything else was just peripheral to that so did your living history and your your research that you've done, like you just mentioned a ton of different historical authors, it, it, that had a significant influence on your products and your mentality of the product? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I'm a big believer in if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Now, you can, <laughs> you, I mean, you can improve on things, obviously. I mean, you look, at, uh, look back in the days of, of Nesmuk, balloon silk, right? Who would have thought, mm -hmm. right? I'm sure that balloon silk was a new thing. Obviously, it was. Um, but once he's found that new thing and it was lighter and it was good for what he wanted and it fit his mentality of the outdoors in carrying less and being able to do the same things, he latched onto it. And for me, it's kind of like, how can I improve this product? It's not broke, but how can I improve it? You know, continuous improvement is a, an engineering thing. It's a quality engineering thing. Continuous improvement and being able to reduce the amount of variability within processes, all of that is basic survival mentality to me. And being able to improve on these older cook systems by making new materials, by making simple improvements and handle designs and things like that, that's what led me to where I'm at today. So living history and history itself has the biggest impact on my mentality and business of anything next to my engineering background. Oh, man, that is cool. That is rich. Awesome. Thank you. 
Uh, for listeners unfamiliar with your wilderness survival school, what are the core principles and skills that you guys teach there? Um, so we teach a couple different paths, if you will, at our school. They all kind of lead to the same end result. But we have a survival series of courses, which just teaches people whether they're new to the woods or they've been doing it for 50 years. It takes them through the basics of how to survive or thrive in that 24 to 72 hour scenario or a little bit beyond. If you get stranded, stuck, an accident happens, you run out of gas on a logging road, you flip your four wheeler, you know, something breaks down, but you can't get out. And I call that 90% of the time, what I call that is inconvenient camping, uh -huh. right? It's, it's not survival. It's inconvenient camping. I didn't plan to be here, but I'm stuck here until tomorrow. I'm stuck here until I can walk out, or maybe I'm far enough in, I'm stuck here until somebody comes looking for me. But that's really not survival if it's not life and death. It's inconvenient camping. So I teach people how to prepare for that because I'm a big believer that in the psychology of survival, if you can get your mind wrapped around, it's really just an inconvenient camping experience, then everything becomes easier. Decisions and stress become much easier and less at a lower level. And so I try to teach that in my basic core series of survival all the way up to the advanced level where you can actually make your own maps do self-rescue, live for a longer period of time if you need to than that initial 24 to 72 hours, plan to be out a longer period of time, like at a hunting camp, a fishing camp, a sugaring camp, things like that. Um, and then our bushcraft series is more of the, you know, I say bushcraft and I almost despise the word, to be honest with you. <laughs> um, and I, I, the funny thing is, you know, I wrote my first book, Bushcraft 101. I tried so hard to convince the publishing company that needed to be called Woodcraft uh -huh. because I really wanted that tradition of a Woodcraft book in the modern era. I wanted that, you know, that Nesmic and that, and that, uh, of course, Kephart camping in Woodcraft. I wanted that to move on and live through history. And they said, you know what, in this day and age, according to the algorithms, according to the computer, according to the powers that be, if we type in woodcraft, we're going to go to fine woodworking and people right. are going to look for a book on fine woodworking. So it has to be called bushcraft because that's the latest buzzword. And so I actually, <laughs> this is a funny thing I'm going to tell you, and probably nobody knows this, that, it, that nobody knows it now because it burned up in the house fire that I had three years ago. But the very first book that I got from the publisher that said bushcraft 101 on it. I actually wrote in black marker wood over bush. So it said woodcraft on it and put it on my shelf because I was so disgusted that we had to call it bushcraft. But, you know, now that I look at it in hindsight, after selling over a million copies of that book and it being translated into 14 foreign languages already, bushcraft was probably the smart decision. So anyway, I got straight off of your question and I apologize for that. But to, to, to your point, the second phase of that or the second leg of that journey is bushcraft at our school which really i liken more to woodcraft i talk about that a lot in my classes where we teach people to recreate things off the landscape so that they don't have to carry so much camping kit instead uh -huh. of carrying irons you know you're making cooking apparatus instead of possibly carrying shelter framing you're creating that framing off the landscape being able to use additional things like withies and vines to conserve your cordage. Being able to make fire with flint and steel instead of necessarily relying on things that are completely expendable like flint and steel, like matches, like cigarette lighters, so that you can extend that resource by creating fire constantly by making char every time because a flint and steel is never going to wear out. You can always find another rock and a steel is never going to wear out. I've got one that's probably over 100 years old now. It still works like the day it was made. So that stuff is gives you longevity to be able to stay in the woods longer and conserve resources and carry less. And that's what I try to teach people in woodcraft and bushcraft. So we have two different avenues there that you can go. And then we have a lot of peripheral classes that kind of blend with the two. We have a rope clinic. We have a medicinal plants class. We have a folk skills, Appalachian folk skills class. We have wilderness first aid. Um, we have intensive navigation. There's several that we have that are kind of peripheral to both of those that you can kind of pick and choose from depending on what avenue you chose to go. And just recently, you're starting to, well, actually, I think you've done it before, but your blacksmithing class. I actually, yeah, it's funny that you asked about that. Um, that class sold out in four days. Um, we, 
<laughs> we had planned. I had blacksmithing classes several years ago, and they filled well, and they did well. The problem with blacksmithing classes is they are intensive classes for people to do, and you can only do so many people at one time. Right. And so what I was finding is I didn't have time to do as many blacksmithing classes as I wanted to do, and then still do everything else. So I kind of had to make a choice. But I had people beating me up for so long about blacksmithing classes that I decided once I got my new classroom down at the bottom finished, and I actually had a physical overhang down there, like a pole barn type building that we used for a classroom. And I had another overhang over a large fire pit that we could move all of that blacksmithing equipment down there and maybe do more people at one time. So we opened this class up to 10 people where I used to only allow six. And so it's kind of a pilot class and it's going to be a basic utilitarian blacksmithing class. We're going to make nails and hooks and fire irons and squirrel cookers and flint strikers and things that you would use in a woodcraft environment or things that you would use in a cabin life environment. And so we're going to start there and see where it goes. That's awesome, man. Can you uh, share some success stories of your classes? Um, you know, I, it's hard for me to share direct stories, but I get Lots and lots of emails. You know, every week I get an email from somebody that's either related to a video they watched or a class they took that paid off big dividends for them in their normal life. Whether it was, you know, I got a flat tire and I plugged it with a piece of paracord and I've then it has absolutely happened. I've had a guy who actually got a flat tire, had a tire repair kit in his vehicle, but he didn't have any of the plugs and he doubled paracord up through that punch device and shoved it in his tire and aired it back up and made it to wherever he needed to go to get the tire fixed properly. So the little simple things like that of multi-use items that you carry every day in your kit to all the way up to, you know, my family and I ran out of gas somewhere or had a problem with our vehicle and we got stuck for a couple of days. And because of the things that we had in our car, because of your videos, we were good to go. We, it became a family experience that we'll never forget even though at the time it just sucked, you know? And so I get a lot of that kind of stuff. I get a lot of stuff that, that people that say, you know, I was on a road, whether it's from PTSD or addiction to some substance or just depression in general, or, or even a catastrophic injury that caused them a huge back set in their outdoor lifestyle. I get emails all the time from people like that and say, you know, watching your videos, going out and practicing your teachings, following your system, watching your attitude day in and day out has changed my life. And I really appreciate that. And I can't tell you how humbling that is to get emails like that. Like I said, at least on a monthly basis, but a lot of times even on a weekly basis. I can tell you from my personal experience that you've influenced me when I uh, started my YouTube channel back in 2020, it was really just a way to connect with my students because we were remote and I had so much time on my hand, I really wanted to start a YouTube channel focusing on Civil War reenacting, living history, right? Okay. And uh, as that kind of fizzled out, I, I found some gear that I had and I was wanting to do some research on. I think it might've been the, the Stonebridge Lantern. Stonebridge and Folding you, Lantern. Yeah, you yep. had a video on it. I was like, wait, what's this? And I watched your video about that and your description of it. And then you got it got me on a rabbit hole, man. I was just starting to watch all your stuff, saw your the one with your pack and making your pack. like you've inspired so many people, including myself. And I thank you for the time and instruction that you give just the world, man. Like, well, I, I appreciate really... that. I mean, you so, know, I think there's a lot of people and not to stray off the subject too much of what you're talking about, because I think that's an awesome compliment to me that that happened to you. And I think it happens to other people too, without a doubt, I hear about it. But what I really think is important. And I think that you're in the same mindset that I am. I think there's two different schools of thought with YouTube today. I think you have the school of thought of, I'm going to go on YouTube so I can get rich. I'm going to make a bunch of money. I'm going to be the next guy with a million subscribers that makes 12 or 14,000 or $50,000 a month off YouTube. And then there's the school of thought that I have that I don't care if I make another dime off YouTube. It's a means to an end because it's education. It's a way for me to reach people that will never be able to come to my school that can never afford to come there, don't have the means to come there, or they live too far away to ever come there. And I can reach them through social media and give them instruction 
that will teach them. So it's an extension of my school that's actually on YouTube. And if it happens to feed my business, great. If it happens to feed sales of my books, great. If it happens to feed my school, great. If it happens to make me a little extra money because my channel's monetized, great. But I will never complain that I'm not making enough money off YouTube or that I'm not getting enough views on YouTube because that's not why I'm doing it. And I think once you, and I think you have that mindset. And there's a few people out there that do, but there's a lot of people that don't. And I think it's a shame because YouTube should really be for guys like us. It should be a teaching platform, not necessarily a monetary platform. And one should just be a benefit of the other. Yeah, I, I agree. The, the education side of it is so powerful. The outreach, the, the impact you can make on people's life really is powerful. And just friendships. Like there's yeah. people that I've inadvertently met through YouTube. They reached out to me and carried on then through Facebook and stuff. And it's really cool how it connects people. It's, yeah, it's unbelievable. I mean, it's made so many connections for me overseas and the travels that I do and things like that. And if you if think about that, you know, the power of social media and, and the reason maybe that this hobby, if you will, this educational platform is getting so big is because social media has such a wide reach. I mean, if you think about it, back in the day, if you look at like Woodcraft and Camping by Horace Cuphart, how many of those books do you think he actually sold during the time it was actually written? I would venture to say, you know, I, I have no idea. I don't know if you could even research that to figure it out, but I would venture a guess that it was probably less than 10,000, probably in the first four or five years that it was written. And if he'd have had social media at that point in time, where he could have advertised that book to millions and millions of people, and just instead of just the people who were probably subscribed to different hunting and trail magazines at that point in time, or publishing houses that could put out letters and press releases through the mail, his reach would have been phenomenal and astronomical. And it would have been Horace Kephart selling a million copies in five or 10 years. It wouldn't have been, you know, or, or Nesmic for that matter. You know, his reach, Nesmic's reach really came from being able, from writing magazine articles, right. And obviously, right? And that reach allowed him to sell probably quite a few books, as well as his, his articles being big and reprinted even to this day. But when you look at that, Look at how many people today are buying those books. I would venture to say that there are 10 times the amount of sales of those books today than there was when they were written. Oh, for sure. And to me, that is a legacy, and that's what I'm after. I want my book to be the book people are reading 100 years from now and comparing things to, like we do today, to Horace Kephart and Nesmith and Hyatt Barrow, William Miller and Hamilton Gibson and all those guys, Thomas Seaton, William Baird, uh, Baird, all those guys. I want myself compared to that a hundred years from now. And I'm sure you do too. It's a heck of a footprint, man. <laughs> well, you know, if you, I, it's, it's an big. aspiration, you know, it's an aspiration. And I think it's, I think you have to give respect to those guys for what they were able to accomplish in that time period. And you have to definitely give them respect for what they even do now. Because guys like me got all of my inspiration from that type of material. So they're influencing someone 100 years later to basically imitate what they were doing, maybe in a modern fashion, maybe with different material, maybe with a little bit different mindset. But it's the same thing. And if yeah, I can yeah. continue that on, that's what I want to do. Yeah, you're adding to it. You, like you said, you're not just copying and pasting stuff. You've, you've drawn from the wisdom, but you've added to it. And it really is applicable to our modern times and our modern way of thinking. Uh, Kephart, I really like his book a lot just because of the way he writes. It, it sounds like you're just talking to him around a kitchen table, you know. And right. your book is very similar in that way. It's practical. It's not, um, it's, it's not like a, a textbook type of reading that it's, you do this, you get this. You do this, you get this. It's almost mechanical. You don't write that way. Kephart didn't write that way. Nesmic, uh, Nesmic was okay. I like his stuff, but it doesn't have all the, the detail and how to like Kephart did. I think Kephart I did a better job of teaching, you know, uh, but he was a, he was a professional writer, you know? Yes. Um, but yeah, yes. your book is definitely well on its way. Uh, in fact, I think it is honestly, like I, I think your book is right there with them. Um, like best-selling books. It's reaching across all these different countries. It's getting interpreted in so many different languages. Man, I think you're there. 
I think your aspirations have. Well, I appreciate it. that. I appreciate that. So, um, what have been some most rewarding moments in your journey as the founder and instructor <laughs> of the school? You know, I think that um, I think that if I told you, you might be surprised because it's probably something that I've never really. I've talked about a lot of things with you today. I've talked to a lot of people about. And I think it's because I feel a connection with what you do more than I do. Somebody who invites me to a podcast who is just trying to get views on a podcast or they, you know, have a podcast that does a lot of varying subject matter. And so they want to bring a subject matter guy in and they pick me. You, I think you have the similar mindset that I have. And so I feel more comfortable talking to you about this stuff in my personal life. Thank but you. to me, the most satisfying thing that I've done so far is being able to not only make it so that my wife doesn't have to work and she can enjoy our grandchildren every day of her life, right? Yeah. When she grew up poor. To the fact that my mother, my father, my brother, my cousins, my his best friend growing up, and a couple of their best friends growing up have a job and a livelihood that I created. So they don't have to worry. So not only, so it comes down to, you know, a lot of people in our, in, in our day and age, and, and maybe even worse in the millennial day and age, but a lot of kids kind of bank on what their parents have to support their future. Mm -hmm. In other words, you know, one of these days my parents are going to be gone and I'm going to have what they have. I'm trying to give my parents what I have now so they don't have to worry about their future and, and what they have is kind of come from me. And, and I think it's kind of a reverse mentality of the way things are looked at nowadays. But I want to basically give my parents what they didn't have now instead of waiting to have what I didn't have until my parents are gone and getting it from them. Do you understand what I mean by that? Yeah, for sure. That's that's the whole point of life, in my opinion. You know, so, yeah. Better the, the opportunities for the, the next generation, but also hopefully give back to the generation that came before you. And then obviously, yes, I want to leave something behind for my granddaughter, you know, my grandchildren in general. I say my granddaughter like she was the first and she's kind of, you know, the favorite, obviously. <laughs> but my grandchildren in general, I want them to have something when I'm gone to, you know, if I, if I could have, do you know Libby Kephart? Yeah. Okay. So I know Libby Kephart as well. If, I, if my granddaughter turns into Libby Kephart, I will be looking down from wherever I'm at saying, I did my job. <laughs> because she does nothing but brag about her grandfather. And she mm -hmm. pushes his legacy to the limit. You know, she is involved in his legacy. And if my granddaughter ends up being like Libby Kephart, I will have done everything I need to do on this earth. For those uh, viewers and listeners don't know, if you are on Facebook, Libby Kepar is a, a big contributor, and I don't. She's probably the admin, or at least one of the admins, of the uh, Kepar Nesmic Brotherhood Facebook group. And she's like Mr. Cambridge said, she's Dave. She's always on there. Uh, anything that you post on there about her grandpa, and she comments about it. Like, you're right. Like, she adores the man. Absolutely. For sure. For sure. Are there any challenges you face when establishing the school that you can share? Um, you know, the challenges I faced are really still challenges today. Finding the people with the proper mindset to teach alongside you is mm -hmm. a difficult thing. That don't expect you to do something for them that they could do for themselves. That That's mm -hmm. difficult. Um, finding someone who has that teacher mindset we've talked about that's not really there for any reason, but they love to teach. And if they make money out of it, that's a bonus. If they get notoriety out of it, that's a bonus. Mm -hmm. Those are hard people to find. And so that's been one of the biggest struggles of my business. You know, I get a group of guys for four or five years and all of a sudden they want more. They expected more. They didn't get what they, they're not as famous as they thought they were going to be. They're not making as much money as they hoped they were going to make. Well, if you came here for those reasons, you came here for the wrong reasons to begin with. Now, right. if you just don't enjoy teaching anymore, you hate or hate being around people and you can't stand teaching, then okay, I get it. You made the wrong choice. But if you came here under false pretenses, because I don't have any bones about telling people, you're not going to get rich working here. I'm not going to make you famous. I'll promote you. 
I'll push you. I'll help you. I'll give you all the free gear you want. I'll help you do whatever you need to do. But I can't make you rich and I can't make you famous. You have to do that yourself. So if that if that's the mindset you came into this with, then you wasted my time and yours. And that's probably one of the biggest struggles in this business is to find that synergy of people. I've got a couple good ones. I mean, I've got one that's been with me for 15 years. Well, I'd say 13 years anyway. Um, Kevin Baxter, who uh-huh. is big in scouting, you know, big in reenactment, is one of the. I was on the board of the uh, reenactment at Vincennes every year, so he's he's got that similar mindset. He's a he's been a scout leader. He's been a scout master. He knows how to teach. He loves teaching people and passing on that knowledge. And he's been with me for 13 years because he had the same expectations I did when he came into it. He came to one class at my school, and he's been with me every since for 13 years. And I can tell you now that I'm probably more loyal to him than anyone other than family and my wife. Because I would give that guy anything I owned to help him out because I believe in him. And he believes in me, and that's the kind of guys I want around me. And those are hard to find. Um, And so that really is the biggest struggle. The next biggest struggle with a school is... The school constantly outgrowing itself Mm -hmm. and having to figure out what you're going to do to fix that you know like i said i started teaching at like scout camps and things like that well you very quickly outgrow that because you can't get them as often as you want them you can't find Mm -hmm. a place to teach as often as you want it so now you got to find your own land and so i leased about 40 acres in the beginning that i actually there was a house on and 40 acres of land that was wooded had a couple caves on it it's been in some videos of past it's where the journal of the year was shot and I outgrew it. You know, you, when you're using resources for every class and you need to make these navigation courses that are more intensive and larger and larger in scale for more advanced classes and more advanced teachings, you run out of room very quickly. And I just, I feel like I've been blessed almost every step of the way that God's probably given me everything I have and put it where it needed to be at the right moment in time. Even if it was a mistake that I made, there was a reason it was made, I think. And it put me in a position where God wanted me to be to do something else. And so when we were looking for another place to have the school, you know, of all places to find something, my wife found our current property on Craigslist. (laughs) It It was in bankruptcy. And so it allowed us to get a larger piece of property that actually backed up directly on three sides to a 4,000 acre wildlife area. And so, you know, again, I think that everything happens for a reason. I think God gives you things when you need them. And that was when we really needed it because the school was bursting at the seams. We were running out of resources. We were looking for places to go. And my wife happened to find this place and it all worked out because at that point in time, I hadn't really been doing this long enough and I wasn't big enough to have this big chunk of money to say, hey, boom, I'm going to buy this piece of property. My credit wasn't the greatest at that point in time, you know, and I've had to work hard to get that straightened out. And so I think that because I was divorced and then that trashed my credit. And so all of those things kind of fit into a puzzle and I think that's I think that's all God's doing and I think that Amen. being at the right place at the right time being able to buy land on contract with a guy who just wanted to be able to get his money back out of it and get out of bankruptcy and he was a good guy he was a loyal guy he was a trustworthy guy all of that doesn't fall into place by accident somebody made that happen so I'm a big believer in that and you know I don't talk about it as much as I should sometimes but on social media nowadays you get persecuted for talking about things like that and I just, again, I feel comfortable talking to you, so I'm telling you. I, I've had similar experiences. Uh, I struggle with faith as a kid. I even went to a Catholic school. And when you're surrounded by religion all the time, uh, you think you would come out of that and a lot stronger in your faith. But I struggled with it until I was an adult. And then various things like you happened. You know, some struggles, like I was in bankruptcy at the 2008 housing crisis and stuff. But anyhow, that's kind of off track. But and in the end, like what you said, I can look back on all these challenges and things that I've experienced, and now I can see God in it. And because of it, my faith has exploded and, and become more uh, solid because of it. Uh, right. I wish more people could see the work in that way, because I don't think <laughs> I don't think most people really get a booming voice in their head and from an angel appearing to them or something like that. Yeah. I think it's the small things 
uh, that you can pick up on, you can finally see it. And then I would absolutely agree with everywhere. that. I would, you know, I would agree with that. And I'm not, I'm not a guy who you know promotes that on social mm -hmm. media, promotes that in videos, and promotes that in person, even with people at my school, because I've not, I've always been, and also I'm kind of a, I'm also a believer that you don't have to go to church to be uh -huh. a good Christian because the woods is the, is church, you know, yeah. the creation is where it's at, you know? And so I'm a big believer in that. And I don't promote that too much, but that's the way I feel internally. And it drives me a lot to do things like that, spend more time outside because I feel like I'm closer to the creator when I'm in his creation. And my house is, you could say that your house obviously was a product of that, but mm -hmm. at the same time, it's not the same. You know what I mean? It's not the variability is not there that you get in nature. And so, Anyway, I just wanted to share that with you because I don't share it with a lot of people, but I think I agree with you in that it's the little things. It's not the big things. I mean, obviously, there's some huge things that have happened in my life, both both good and bad, that have directed me in certain directions, and I think that's all God's will. But at the same time, the little things that happen day in and day out are the things that I try to take notice of now that make me really say, yep, there he is. That's it. I got it, you know, or if I have a, a challenge for the day or a challenge for the week or something happens at my school where I lose someone I don't think I should have lost or someone does me wrong, you know, it's like, okay, well, there was, there was something to that. There's a lesson to be learned there. I just got to figure out what it is and, I, and I'll get through it. It's not a big deal. And so I don't dwell on that kind of stuff. That's why on my YouTube channel, you know, you never see me take the low road on social media. You never see me bashing people or talking bad about people on social media, whether it's businesses or individuals. And I don't do it in videos really either, except to defend myself once in a while a little bit without right. saying, Oops. you know, but at the same time, I just don't think it's a necessary evil. I think it's something that, you know, if you're positive all the time, that's going to create positivity around you. And it's, if you're thankful for everything you have, then you're going to continue to receive. As soon as you get disgruntled with life, Life's going to start throwing rocks at you. I just believe that. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Can you share any upcoming projects or initiatives that you're enthusiastic about, either with your school I, or outdoor company? I can, brother, and you're going to be the first guy. How about that? Okay. Awesome. So, a couple things going on right now. First of all, I am in the middle of negotiations for another book. Same publishing nice. company. This one's going to be called working title at the moment, but I hope they stick with it. 101 Bushcraft Projects. So Bushcraft 101, 101 Bushcraft Projects. Oh, that'd be cool. So it's going to be in sections, obviously, you know, from camp craft to fire making to, you know, cordage craft, to think, containers, but it's going to be 101 different projects that are woodcraft. Let's just say it out loud. There are woodcraft <laughs> projects. Um, <laughs> But it's going to be titled Bushcraft. So anyway, um, and I don't mind splurting that out there. It doesn't bother me a bit. Um, so that's that's a big thing going on. I usually take, this is my time really to write is from that time frame of November to February because that's trapping hunting season for me. I don't teach a lot of classes on purpose because that's my downtime. That's the time I take to hunt. I take to trap. I take to write. I take personal time with my family. You know, Iris and I generally take a couple of weeks and go somewhere. And that type of stuff. So that's my vacation period. Like teachers take a three-month vacation in the summer. I take my vacation in the winter. But anyway, um, beyond that, I actually have a phone call I've got to get on as soon as I get off of this podcast with a production company in Ireland that is shooting some kind of a survival series in Ireland. And they want to bring their host to the U.S. for the first episode of the show to film him being trained in survival. And that's so we're cool. going to film that for three days at the school. Um, and that's going to be toward the end of this month. So I'm excited about that as well. It's uh, it's not that I'm excited about being on television again, because I can really care less about that. Um, <laughs> it's that I'm excited about another opportunity to work with another country. You know, I've never worked in Ireland before or with the Irish people before too much. Um, so I made one trip to Ireland and it lasted about a week. And then I was gone. But I've never had a chance to work with a lot of Irish people and get, you know, the name Pathfinder School and the name Dave Canterbury into the Irish eye, per uh -huh. se. And I would love to do that. So them coming over and filming that and it airing on Irish television 
is going to be a good thing. And I think it's going to be an enjoyable experience for me to teach someone who I won't say there's a language barrier because they speak English, but I know enough Irish people. There's a language barrier. Let me tell you, because it's hard to understand what they're saying. So it's going to be a fun challenge to him to understand me and me to understand him and trying to train him at the same time. Oh, that's going to be a blast, man. Yeah, All right. So I got some rapid fire questions for you because I know your time is valuable. So uh, wilderness survival gear is essential. Could you highlight some of your favorite gear or tools that you find indispensable in the wild? Okay, so I'll, I'll tell you one tool. I'll tell you what one tool is that I think is indispensable, and we'll, we'll do, and it's you're saying quick fire, but I can never quick fire anything because I I just I feel like justification is necessary in anything you say sometimes, at least in this business where you're trying to tell people this is why I would do what I would do. Um, beyond a knife, which obviously everybody knows that should be something you have on you, I would say a saw is an indispensable tool. Above an axe above anything else a saw is an indispensable tool because you can do almost everything with a saw you could do with an axe mm -hmm. in a woodcraft environment where you're not trying to build a cabin you don't need to fell large trees it's safer to use than an axe it weighs less than an axe True. and the learning curve is less with a saw than it is with an axe so in that case and in my courses i teach you know an axe is way more important or a saw is way more important than an axe to learn within the beginning. So that's one tool I would say is indispensable. The other tool I'd say is indispensable is a metal container of some sort that's impervious or can be put into fire, open fire, so that you can disinfect water, make medicine, cook food, carry water over distance. Those things, those things I think are absolutely a must. And then obviously, I mean, I fall back and revert to the five C's, which I think are obviously, you know, critical inputs. But to me, if I was talking about somebody buying something and spending the money to buy the best, I would say make sure you have the best saw you can buy. Make sure you have a container that is thick wall, heavy food grade stainless steel that you can carry water over distance, cook food, make medicine, and use as a chamber that you can charm material in over the fire. And then everything else, you can get away with cheaper stuff. I can go buy a, you know, a $10 steel nylon or a $10 crappy tarp from Walmart and the thing would last me for a month if I needed it to. I can buy the cheapest ferro rod on the market, and if I have the skill level to use it, it's going to be fine. Or with my skill level, I'll just make a bow drill fire if I have to, right? But I'll use the ferro rod first. A Bic lighter is $1.79. There's no money in that. If you're talking about indispensable, I would say things that you have to spend the money on to get the quality piece of gear that you absolutely need. And for me, in the 5C realm, you know, that would be a good container and a good... Uh, excuse me, lost my train of thought, and a good saw. Because everything else, I can buy an $18 Old Hickory Butcher Knife, no problem, it's fine. I can buy a $5 ferro rod, it's fine. I can buy a lighter, it's fine. I can buy a crappy tarp, it's fine. I can buy any roll of baling twine, and it will work. The things that won't work very long are crappy containers and shitty saws. That's just the way it is. Uh, so I think those things have to be thought about. I mean, there's so many gold nuggets in there, and you actually uh, touched on like two more of my questions, so I don't know if I have to answer, ask that. That's one. okay. Ask him anyway, buddy. Uh, so the next question is, how important is adaptability in wilderness survival and outdoor adventures? I think it is critical thinking and adaptability are the key to survival. That's just it to me. That is the key element to survival, is being able to understand what the problem really is and then being able to analyze it to the point that you can fix it and eliminate the variability. Uh, there's an engineering formula that I tell people about in survival all the time because I think engineering and survival go hand in hand in a lot of ways. And formula is Y equals F of X. And what that means is the output is always a function of the inputs and the inputs variable affect the output. So eliminating variability, identifying the critical inputs to what you want in the end is how you understand how to survive. And adapting to that, being able to adapt to variability within the system to eliminate it is the most important thing. And I tell people, a lot of people make survival out to be this big complicated uh, thing that costs a lot of money to learn. Let's put it that way, okay? To me, survival boils down to three very simple things. Don't bleed out, don't get too hot, don't get too cold. <laughs> It's that simple. If you can avoid those three things, you're okay. And so 
understanding how to do that is the key. Understanding the variability within all the things that you need, the goals you need to accomplish to avoid those three things and adapt to them is where survival is at. If you look at adaptation through human history, it's quite evident. And I'm a big believer in if it ain't broke, don't fix it. <laughs> That's solid. What's your all-time favorite historical period or figure? Well, that is a tough one there. That, that's a tough one. That's a tough one because, you know, I'm so drawn to so many different areas of history, whether it's prehistoric history with Oats of the Iceman or whether it's current or more localized history with people like Fred Bear from the 1960s. Uh, so, I, I, man, I, I have to fall back to my guy, Horace Kepar, you know. I have to fall back to that period where woodcraft and camping had went beyond just the let's go on vacation to get away from the rat race of the factory to we're going out and we're going to hunt we're going to fish we're going to camp we're going to fellowship we're going to have fun we're going to take our buddies we're going to have a good time we're not making this is not necessarily a vacation it's an experience and i think that that really draws me to the most in history i think that's, that's a great answer as an instructor and mentor what is the most important piece of advice you give to individuals pursuing women's survival skills do not be afraid to think outside the box and always keep an open mind. That's solid. Uh, you've had a long and diverse career in outdoor industry. What motivates and inspires you to continue pushing the boundaries of your expertise? Man, you know what? To me, I don't even know what the exact answer to that is other than it is in my soul. Um, because I, anything I do, whether it is Developing a new class, improving a current class, teaching someone something they've never done before, developing a new product, um, finding out what's going to be the best material to use for a certain line of items. All of that stuff to me is the thrill of the chase <laughs> yeah. and the kill, right? It's the kill. That To me, it, that's what it is to hunt, right? It's the thrill of the chase and the hunt. And that's so ingrained in my body that everything I do becomes that. It's where can I find my next coal handle skillet, right? If I if I drive past an antique mall, I'm turning around if I've never been there. I'm like, there's got to be a coal handle skillet in there. Hell, there might be a bush pot in there. I got to go stop and check that out. Who knows when I'm going to find that Abercrombie and Fitch sleeping bag, right? It's the thrill <laughs> of the chase, right? That's, that's what it is. And when I develop a new product, for me, it's like, it's not only do I think this product is awesome, it's how many other people are going to think this is awesome? And I guess the gauge to that is how many of you sell. And the benefit of that's making money. But really, that's not my focus. My focus is how many other people are going to love this? How many other people is this going to benefit? How many other people are going to think that the one-quart bush pot nesting in the two-quart bush pot, nesting in the three-quart bush pot, nesting in a skillet, put in a bag, is the greatest thing since sliced bread, and they haven't seen it since they were a kid, and they got to have one because it's stainless steel. That, that, to me, is where the thrill comes from, right? The money is just a side benefit. To me, it's the thrill of creation and the hunt that really draws me into all of it. it's in my soul i can't get rid of it i can't stop it's competitive nature i guess in a way and my it drives my wife crazy because you know we'll be laying in bed for a half an hour 45 minutes sometimes and i'll be like hey iris are you awake i just thought of something i gotta talk to you about this she'll be like are you freaking kidding me go to sleep dude talk to me in the morning and i'm like no wait a minute i gotta get up and write this down because i don't want to lose it you know and so i've got like 15 of these little right in the rain notebooks strapped together with a rubber band at my desk and all of them have different subject matter and if i think of something i go yank it out and i write it down so i can refer back to it the next day or the next week or when i get a chance to develop that idea or that product or that class or that new project and, and so i guess that's really that that's the it's a long answer but it's really just kind of it, it's just inbred in me and i can't get rid of it it's in my gene that is the best answer. I mean, the passion you just conveyed and everything just speaks volumes right there about you and your, your values, your priorities. It really does. Uh, finally, last question. What message would you like to convey to our podcast and video listeners who share your passion for history, outdoor skills, and adventure? I would say that you should do the maximum amount of research that you can do on any subject matter that you feel strikes your fancy. 
And one of the things that I believe in greatly is what I call immersion training. Pick a subject and do it till you can't do it wrong. Then move on to something else. Do that till you can't do it wrong. And then revisit the last one to make sure it became muscle memory before you moved on. And I think if you do that, you can understand whatever subject matter it is you want to understand, whether it's living history, whether it's bushcraft, whether it's survival, whether it's hunting, fishing, camping in general, trapping, whatever the subject matter is that drives you to learn, immerse yourself in that subject matter until you can't do it wrong and then find a new passion because you always will find something else that drives you even in the midst of doing one subject you're going to get off in a rabbit hole on other things and you kind of you can't be tempted to do that you kind of have to put that rabbit off to the side and put him in another hole for a minute and concentrate on this one and then follow back in there when you get done so you get caught chasing the cheese for so long that you get lost in the maze <laughs> well said but to my uh, my younger students my 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 middle schoolers that'd be just be a lifelong learner <laughs> I mean, that's that really, that's it. I mean, I, every day I try to learn something new. You know, if I, if I can't glean something new every day, then I feel slighted when I go to sleep. You know, I'm like, damn, I didn't learn anything today. I didn't have any new ideas. I didn't come up with any new projects. I didn't change anything in a class. I didn't do nothing today. But if I do a lot of stuff in one day, you know, yesterday, I just made a comment last night to my wife, we were getting to eat supper. And I was like, you know what? I feel really accomplished today. I got a lot of stuff done on social media. I got a really good video shot for SRO. Um, I developed a new technique for being able to do something in a class. And I even rehandled an ax head that a lot of people said wouldn't be able to happen because it would be junk because I had a plastic handle on video. And I knew I could do it. It's just a matter of looking at it and finding out how. And then it was like, okay, all that made me feel really good. Whereas if I just sat around on a computer all day and not done anything and stayed in the house and watched you know, TikTok videos tell tell my mind was numb. I would have felt very unaccomplished. So continuing to learn, continuing to strive, continuing to try and find new things and new avenues in your life, I think it's really, really important every day. Because when you stop doing that is when you start dying, I think. Amen. You know, my father is a big inspiration to me. And I, want, I know you said we we're almost done. I just wanted to get this out really quick because I think it's important. But my father worked for RCA for 30 years and he retired and when he retired he couldn't stand it and one of his friends that retired at the same time actually died within a couple months of retiring and i think my dad took that to heart and blamed the fact that he retired on that because he hadn't really been sick the whole time my dad had known him mm -hmm. so my dad got a job at home depot became a manager at home depot after he was retired from rca and then when I started my business and it got so big, I couldn't handle it myself. I asked him and my brother to come in and help me manage and run this business. And I took him out of, out of Home Depot to run, to help me run SRO. He's actually the vice president of Pathfinder. Uh, my brother's the CFO and I'm the president. And so now at 86 years old, he gets up every morning, he goes to the knife shop. He checks on their production schedule for the day before, checks what materials they need ordered, and check what's in the next knife run, what's coming back from Waterjet, what's out for heat treat, what's out for logo, where they're at on final production to go to the shop or to the warehouse. Then he drives another 15 miles from the airport to the warehouse over on the south side of Indianapolis and checks in with my brother to make sure that everything's okay for the day. And then by noon, he's home eating lunch with mom and he's done for the day. But every day it gives him a reason to get up and do something. And at 86 years old, he can still do that. And I just hope and pray that at 86, I can still do that. Oh, man, that is awesome. 86 years old, still that active. That is pretty impressive. Dude. Every day. <laughs> well, uh, before we leave, are there any upcoming uh, classes or promotions or anything that you want to let our listeners know to check out um, on your website or you know, on okay. your school? So I would tell people a couple things. I would say go to selfrelianceoutfitters.com. Go to the training tab, pull the training tab down, and that will give you the training tab will give you a list of classes that you can go to to see what classes are coming up in your future. There is an event in Vinton County, Ohio, in 2024. You can go to their website. It's called Old School Survival Boot Camp. We've kind of thrown in with them this year for our Pathfinder gathering, and we'll be at that event doing the entire Pathfinder experience plus supporting the Old School Survival Boot Camp in Vinton County. And you can find 
early bird tickets to that. I think they're like 99 bucks. You can find early bird tickets to that if you go to OSS's website. And then I would just tell you to, you know, keep an eye on social media for me and for you. New things coming up all the time. Um, and I hope to see you at a classroom event as soon as I can. What are your handles on uh, Facebook or on uh, YouTube or any other handles that you have? You can find almost everything by just looking up my name directly or looking up Pathfinder Survival. My handle on Facebook is actually Woodland Bushcraft. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Dave, for joining us today on Campfire Chats. This has been an awesome discussion with you. I, I love talking to you. This is a great opportunity that you've given me and I and my viewers and our listeners. I really appreciate it, man. No problem, brother. I like what you do. <laughs> Thank you. I hope you have a great day, everybody else. Make sure to check out all those links. We'll catch you guys later. Take care. Okay, buddy. Thanks.